skulle ha sommerkjøreskolen. Ja, det var det. Sommerkjøreskolen er for ungdom mellom... Sammen. Vi har hunder som er snøte, søde. Jeg heter Lena. Jeg har hatt sur. Ja, men det har alltid vært få sekunder og har en vei. Lena Boys in Hills, da. Lena Boys in Hills, da. Lena Boys in Hills, da. You sing a song for the broken hearted No silent prayer for faith departed Hello friends of Machine Sport Line, I'm Katrin and everyone is welcome to this interview section. This time we are with the 25 times world champion, 50 times European champion and 30 times Norwegian champion, Mrs. Lena Boysen Hilsta. Hi Lena, how are you? Hi, I'm fine, how are you? Very fine. So I know that you come from a family where motion was already present. Uh, yeah. Could you tell us um, a bit about your first encounters with this practice? I was uh, five years old and my parents asked me if I wanted a, a dog or sister or brother. And of course I said I wanted the dog. And then the Santa Claus brought me a dog and uh, it was just by coincidence, it was a German shorter pointer. The dog you can use, mostly used for polka, skiing, and, and now also dry land racing. And then my father started. So when I was five years, he started to do the sport. And he, re he was really, he wanted me to be a part of the sport. So he, uh, he built a small cart with wheels. So I could sit on the cart because I was so small, too young to run. And he was running, training, and our dog, Nusse, she was pulling the cart and I was sitting there. So when he went for a long run and stuff, I was always with him. So I was present and yeah, he, he was really nice taking me to everything. So I learned a lot and yeah, got to be out and got the interest for the sport too. And what's the difference between a pulka and a slip? Uh, when you go with the puka, you usually go with one dog in front, or you can go with more, but you have the dog in front, and you have this puka behind. And in the puka, you should have 70% of the dog's weight. So it's similar to the old days when we didn't have so many snowmobiles and possibilities to go out in the woods. So the ambulance people, they used pukas to carry people and the military used pulkas to carry their gear and today they use more like snowmobiles and other equipment but earlier it was because they had to use the pulka and that's what we try to to keep to create the same thing for the dogs so then we go skiing behind as fast as we can just like a cross-country skier so it's a dog a heavy pulka and then a skier and if you go with the sled then you are standing on the sled without skis and you have four, six, eight or more dogs in front just pulling the sled. They don't pull in. So um, this puka thing is very, very Scandinavian because they say we are born with skis on our feet. So that's pretty much how it is in Norway. Everyone, everyone can go skiing and it's very common to, as a rec recreational thing to go skiing. And I know that you was already influenced by mushing because of your dad practice mushing. Mm -hmm. But can you tell us how did you start practicing uh, mushing? Oh, uh, the same way we do now up here okay. in Norway. You bring your kids uh, out. Uh, maybe running with a dog or skiing with a dog and in the beginning you can have if you're really small if the kid is really small you can have one dog and you can have two bungees two lines so it's more safe so if the kid falls down it's easy to stop the dog 
and when they get a little older they get their own dog and and uh, for me i started to train with a cross country group uh, that's uh, ski skiers who don't uh, participate with dogs they just go skiing so it's not normally you train a lot you go with the other people to train and then you train your dogs so, so um, yeah you just bring your kids and even on uh, bikes i you know we we let kids from like eight ten years go with one dog in a bike so wow. over son he was when he started to bike with the uh, with his own dog he was uh, about uh, I don't know, 26, 28 kilo, the boy, and the dog was uh, 34. Oh. So the dog was more heavy than him. And, yeah. But uh, that, that's the way we do it. So just put the helmet on them. <laughs> yes. And how were your first machine competitions? How did you decide that you wanted to compete on machine races? I think uh, competing has always been fun, uh, like everything. If you change uh, tires on your cars or whatever you do, I think it's fun to be fastest. So I think that was just in the genes or something. So it was just it came natural because my father was competing, and then it was fun for me to start when I was old enough. And the first race was with a polka. And it was in 1979, a long time ago. <laughs> and I was so small, so tiny. And I, I remember I fell in a hill. But uh, even though it was, yeah, it was much fun. And I just wanted to do more and more. And, and then it was competitions every weekend. And we got more dogs. And then my father competed and I competed. And when I got a little older, so I started to train seriously myself condition physical then uh, I got to use the best dogs and my father took the second best and then yeah it started wow. with very good results in the end and I think that being a multi-champion involves many things but what key factors made you grow in this sport and what did you think that did you you were 25 first places on world championships. Um, it's really important to be friends with your dogs and you pay respect and you are consistent. So if you say something, you have to go through with it to think all the time. And uh, you always put the dogs first. Uh, if you sleep too long for school or work, you don't go down and eat yourself. The first thing you do is take care of the dog and if you don't have time for eating your dogs first. Also with training and uh, fixing the, the paws, anything, it's always, you never skip anything. And it's no, it's no shortcuts. You just have to, to do the, the job. But I really like to be together with the dogs and I really love them, but still I'm quite um, strict with them. So they know exactly how I, how I feel about them. And here is, uh, here, here is the new Hi. champion. So oh. this is Andre and he is 17 and he won the world championships uh, in senior class two years ago in France. Wow. So I am retiring and he's the new one. Hi. Can you share with us what's the best thing about running in snow compared to your island classes? Um, it's. Uh, have you seen pictures? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it, it says everything. <laughs> the sun and the snow is just so amazing. And, but the fun in uh, dryland is also very, of course, it's, yeah, it, it's the same, you get excited and stuff, but you get so muddy. And in the snow, in the winter, uh, it's so clean. And if you get the sun in addition, 
uh, it's just uh, it's magic. So um, if you have any uh, any Mexican friends or yourself, and you ever want to come visiting in the winter here, we have rooms for you, and you can stay with us, and we can take you ski during. Thank so you very much. Welcome. Thank you. And how did you decide to train and compete in rally classes too? It was because uh, it gets less and less snow in the world. You know, yeah. it's uh, earlier it was more snow all over. And the dry land thing, the, it just grew bigger and bigger. And in 2002, the first world championship was held in Italy. And we read it, okay, World Championship Italy, dry land, that must be, we, we have to try. Because we train a lot dry land, so it should be good for us. But we, we never trained speed. So we were really surprised by the high speed. And it was really difficult in the corners because we always break. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we learned very fast. And uh, yeah, I won the first uh, World Championship in Italy with the... Uh, scooter yeah. and I think bike so uh, yeah we did well but we learned a lot in the beginning because uh, uh, all our training had, had always been very slow because you don't want to hurt your dogs so it's better to have the bungee tight you know the bungee yeah not, not like this but all tight and then yeah. uh, the dogs feel secure when they run they feel that you are behind them and you don't get any paw, it's it less injuries on the paws. Yeah. So that's why we always train slow. But now after dryland uh, is so big, we, we had to train a little bit different. But it was in 2002 and uh, after that we do, we done uh, all the championships in dryland too. <laughs> <laughs> and did you think that dog boots are important in Dryland classes and snow? Depending on the dogs and the paws. Yeah. My husband has uh, 15 Alaska Huskies. Yeah. And uh, they run more um, smooth and nice in a way. So he, he, he don't use much booties. But our dogs, when you have mix between the German Shorter Pointer and Greyhounds and dogs like that, they are so explosive. So in every step they are really yeah they uh, it's hard to have uh, the pause right so yeah we use a little bit of cost of um, booties in the especially in the fall and in the winter if the conditions are okay we don't use booties and if it's very hard no icy we sometimes have to use booties but if the feet are good you don't use booties it's just if you see you need them. And from your point of view, is there a specific discipline to start in mushing or we can start in whatever we like? I, I think uh, the candy cross is a great way to get new people into the sport because uh, everyone almost on this earth have a pair of sneakers, uh, shoes you can run in. And so many people have a dog and you don't need a very, very fast or special dog to do candy cross. You can do it with any dog. So it's really good for getting more people into the sport. So in Norway, we have races going on every, I don't know, every second week or something in the summer yeah. when all the other uh, competitions are off. Uh, and it's so many people coming there with all kinds of dogs. And then some of them want to join the sport because they, oh, we didn't know it was a sport and it's so much fun. So I think candy cross is a really good thing. And of course, up here in Norway, go skiing is also very easy because people do have skis and many people have a dog and we just have to guide them a little bit. So starting with wooden dog is a very good idea. Yeah. And... What does mushing mean for you? Is it uh, your life or just a yeah. hobby? It, it, it's pretty much my life, yes. Because uh, I've done it all my life. I had dogs almost all my life. And now I have my son, Andre, and he's doing the sport. 
our daughter she did the sport but she uh, she's now playing golf but uh, I do a lot of uh, I make races and make camps for younger people and yeah I yeah I it means a lot it's kind of what I do and I feel very yeah it's in my heart I really want yeah. sport to be good to grow and I want people to look at us and and be happy about what we're doing so yeah it's yeah. my life that sounds very fine. I think that it's a very beautiful sport and that people should know this sport because it's amazing to race with your dog. Yeah, it's the connection you have with your dog is so amazing, as you said. And uh, up here we can let dogs run free, special times of the year. And when you let them free and they run in the woods and you see how happy they are, it makes you so happy just to see their joy of life. So yeah, it, it's just beautiful because dogs are so nice and so happy. Anyway, they just love you and they love life. And uh, they're big. Uh, uh, I think we uh, humans can look up to the dogs actually because how they behave is really, really great. And do you think that is very important, the connection we do with the dog? For this that's sport, the, we most, need to do that connection? Yeah, that's the most important thing. Because if you just, if you're a really good runner and you don't care about the dog, the dog will notice at once and they don't want to perform as well as if you connected with the dog. And we have so many examples for that. We have good skiers getting good dogs for, for a race or just, and it, it just didn't work out, even if the skier is really, really good. So you need to have the connection. And it's so, if you, when you have your own dog, if you want the dog to, to perform and be a part of your machine life for many, many years, it's really important to have the connection and respect with the dog or else he will be, get just yeah, like pissed and he, yeah, I yeah. don't want to run for you. <laughs> yeah. So you have to be nice. And then, then you can have the dog and run with them for yeah, like their eight or nine years. Very, very good. And how are the first trainers for a beginner? How did you teach the beginners yeah uh, depending on what you're doing if you do uh, if you do bike of course for the humans it's easy because you yeah. you can say biker you can go to a bicycling group and learn from good techniques and stuff and if you go canny cross it's important to be a good runner and it's all kind of uh, books about running. I mean, it's easy to know what to do. Same with skiing. You just have to be a good skier. So go to people that can ski and do good technique and have a good uh, physique. But for dogs, um, and for really beginners, it's uh, like when I just bring some kids up in the trail here, it's uh, the first thing is never let go of the dog yeah. because if you lose the dog, it can easily be scared. Maybe they get the bungee in their ass. <laughs> then they get scared and don't want to run. Or if you lose the bike, you fall off and you let go of the bike. And then they run with the bike behind. The, the dogs get really, really scared. So no matter what happens, you, you hold the dog or you hold the bike. That's the first thing. And for training, uh, it's not no use to win the training. You don't have to pedal and be the first one. You should yeah. break so the dog feels secure. And uh, the dogs will always want to run faster. So if you break when you train and then you come to a competition and you let go of the brakes, the dogs are so happy and it runs yeah, very, very happy. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and not train too long because... Uh, if you train more than the dog are used to or fit to, 
they will get bored and you will uh, destroy some of the yeah, connection and respect you, you have between you and the dog. So you really, if you don't know, if you're a little bit unsure, then you just train a little shorter. And you have to, as a owner or a trainer from a dog, you have to have the right stomach feeling. You understand that yeah. word? So you, you feel what's right all the time. And if you go out and you have plans for um, 10 kilometers, and after one kilometer, one, two kilometers, you stop and you take a break and you see that uh, the dog is really, really tired, yeah. then you go back. You don't continue. So you can always change the plan because it's like humans. Some days we are very fit and, and some days we can be tired. So then you have your stomach feeling. So if you are unsure, you just uh, take it easy with the dog. So our training plans should depend on how our dogs feel. Yeah, because you can make a plan, but you shouldn't stick to the plan if, if there are something that saying you shouldn't do it. Yeah. So you make a plan, but maybe uh, if it's really, really tired, maybe you should take the next day off and then just make some changes in the plan. Because some people, they are so stuck with their plan and they just do the plan no matter what, and, the, and then uh, yeah, they, they never perform good. Okay, and what type of trails should we do to when we are training for a competition? Should we look for a trail similar to the trails in competitions? Yeah, or? that would be good, but uh, it's depending on where you live. Because yeah. sometimes, or uh, yeah, I live different places with different training conditions, and it all worked out. But it's important to train in different places, so the dogs know different ways of uh, uh, surface, hills, turns, everything. And it's also more fun for the dogs if you try to do different places. But uh, I have always practiced to train longer and slower than the competition and just before the competition I uh, I train a little bit faster and shorter so they get the speed right for the competition but the main training is longer and slower because then if there's really bad conditions in the race they are used to be trained more and it's not a problem so like uh, when we go on snow, normally we have very hard trails, so it's really fast. But if it's snowing, 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 we can get a lot of snow, and it's really hard to run in the snow. And if you have good training in front, it's no problem. But if you always train the specific distance very fast, they will be so tired because it's more tough these days. Understand? Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's important to remember that uh, when you and I train, we can train a lot uh, three months before a big championship and we get really tired and we know that, okay, we do this because we want to be the champion. So we have to train now. But dogs, they don't understand that. They yeah. train because it's fun. So you have to keep their motivation high by changing places, doing different stuff, training with friends. Just try to do the train, training much fun, so yeah. they uh, they don't think about what they're doing actually. And uh, do we need to train without dogs, or every training should be with the dog? No, if you're a canny cross, of course you need to train without dogs. Yeah, because then you need more conditioning yourself. So the way we do, because we do uh, two dog scooter and sled mostly, yeah. uh, it's not so hard on uh, on us as human beings. So when we train um, the dogs, we don't do anything behind the dogs because we want to have the dog training as dog training. So on the scooter, we just stay back show and we go and we never we never kick but if they go into trot then we kick but if they keep the galop we just yeah. stand there 
So if we want to be fit, we have to go out running afterwards. So right now in the summertime, we do a lot of, we run in stairs, you know, big uh, stairs. Yes. <laughs> Without walking. And we do different stuff uh, like biking, running, roller skis, whatever, without those. Because it's always good to be in good shape. Okay. And did you have a special training or special things to do? If we want to achieve a larger and stronger kick on the scooter? Because I saw a picture where you are kicking on yeah. the scooter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, you need condition because you get tired yeah. when you do the uh, kicking. So that's normal, like uh, you do some uh, long distance trainings and you do some intervals and you do strength training, like uh, lifting stuff and things. Yeah. Uh, but we haven't done anything specific for the kicking, but we yeah. do, we do train a little bit, uh, kick bike without dogs because that can be smart and then it's good for the technique and it's also good for uh, just our condition. It's really important to know how to do the turns in the right way, both sides. So it's important to kick some kicks with the left leg and some with the right and then turn both ways. It depends on where are you going to do the turn. Yeah, but uh, it's really fast. So uh, I think uh, the last championship, yeah. uh, Andre was like uh, three seconds or whatever behind the best senior when he was a junior so it's so uh, it's so uh, little so the details are important so on the kick bike it's really important to do to make the right choices oh. and be a good teacher so uh, of course you need some power in your legs yeah that's really good but for anything you do in life it's good to be in good shape and it's really easy to find good uh, training methods for humans because we can think and we can make a plan and but for dogs it's more you have to be a little bit clever oh and how do you determine the role that the dog will have in the team for example in cart on scooter or uh, just flip? like training. We just, uh, we just see if uh, some dogs are meant to be leaders and some are meant to be not leaders. But we always train every dog to be a leader. Yeah. But some dogs are better leaders than others. So we, we, when we go ski during, they are all leaders because we go with one or two dogs and we, we try to test everyone. So all dogs can be in front. You don't train specific for that. It's just uh, actually you hope all of all of the dogs will be leaders. And how did you know where the dog feels more comfortable? Yeah, I know they. Some dogs they just run a little bit different if they're on the wrong side. So you just have to test that on training. So make sure that you test them on both sides. Yeah. And in front, so, so you just find out what works best. Uh, and uh, I know of many dogs, they don't like to have all the dirt in their eyes. So some dogs run much better in front in a team than behind. Because yeah. behind you get all the dirt all the time. So you have to train and see what works best. So it's just, uh, you'll just see that through the training. Yeah, you have to train and test where they feel better. Yeah. And how do you focus your dogs uh, when you are running? How do you avoid maybe fighting or being distracted? And how do you do to keep them pulling always? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the first thing to to keep them nice, not biting other dogs and stuff. It's uh, first it's in the breed, of course, in the breeding. But uh, you, you always have to learn a puppy how to behave. So we are always many dogs together. Like tonight, we're going to a big, big place with a fence around. And I bring five dogs and there will be 15 other dogs there. So 20 dogs together and they don't live together. But And then we meet and they play and we do that a lot. We have them free together. Uh, so they get used to other dogs. And if they do something we don't like, we say, no, don't do that. And, we, uh, and if they are doing anything in a race, if you someone passes you and your dogs are playing or yeah, not biting, but playing, yeah, then you should stop and let the other team pass. And uh, next time you can't use that dog. Then you have to just train. So for training, if you go uh, with many people, and you can have one dog each and you train the passing. So, okay, the first one slow down and then the other one comes and you have to be there and telling the dog what's right or wrong. And also, if you use two dogs, the neckline uh, is yeah. really good. Because uh, if I'm supposed to say, no, don't do that, it's too late. But yeah. when they try to do something and they have a neckline, they get the instant, uh, oh, this is wrong. <laughs> Yeah. A very stable, good dog in the neckline is very, very good. Uh, but to keep them pulling, hmm, that's hard to say because it's crazy. Dogs are crazy. They just run, they die. And then when you take the harness up again, they want to run more. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, I think a dog will run, if a dog will run this good, but yeah. it's able to run this good, physically able, but it only runs like this. If you train a lot, you will rise this. You get closer yeah. to the, the maximum thing. So if you train your dog uh, good, it's easier to so they run the keep the pace for a longer distance. Oh. Uh, but yeah, it's a little bit uh, hard to answer because it's a little bit strange how they just they just love to run they want to, do, they want to please us so if you are very nice with the dogs they are more willing to please you but if you are if you're not nice you say bad things and you behave bad the dogs they don't they don't actually like you then they don't want to run they just run until it's not fun anymore but if they really have a good connection with you they will run further so, yeah. And you talk about the harness. When did you put the harness to the dog? A um, little bit depending on how the dog is growing. Yeah. But uh, from maybe six months on a Alaska Husky, very light built dog and a grazer also quite. But if you have a, a big, uh, like a quadrat, yeah, a very powerful dog, puppy. Then you should wait because uh, you can have shoulder problems. You can have uh, a lot of problems. But six months, just pull a little bit by running, yeah. maybe just some hundred meters, or bike uphill. So or or uh, but not the they they uh, they need to be safe. So go on a very safe place and uh, have a good bike. Because if you have brakes, that will make a lot of sound. When you brake and it's ee, then they get scared, right? So just do the things very safe for the puppy and you do it short. And yeah. if the puppy is really, really happy and jumping around and jump, running in front of you playing, then you can do it again. But if the puppy is on your side, yeah. then they just want to please you and they do that as long as they can, but they should be able to run in front and be a little bit stupid, then it's okay. But if they stay beside you, then you don't do it anymore. Then you wait a little bit. And do you think that the older dogs should teach the puppies? Yes, a lot. Why? Yes. 
uh, uh, because dogs learn from each other. So if you have good adult dogs, it's much easier to get good puppies because they, uh, they, uh, they want to be like the older, like if you have, if you're a sports fan and you have a, sorry, uh, Pauliana, you look up to someone, you know? Yeah. You probably have some, yeah. And I think it's the same with dogs because I can see it out here. The best dog we have, she's a little bit um, queen. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, kind of bitchy. Uh, but <laughs> all the dogs want to play with her and run with her because she's the coolest one. And it's almost like they understand that she is the, yeah, she is the queen. And if she don't even like them. They just run after her and want to do the same thing she does. So, yeah, I think it's like the humans. And... How did you measure the performance and the progress that your dog had? How I know that my dog is better than he was uh, last month? No, nah, that's really hard uh, because we we don't train very much speed. Yeah. I know others do that. And I know you you had the Igor. Igor. Didn't you? Yeah. yeah. He's probably a little bit different. And we have a saying that is, it's many ways leading to Rome. I don't know if that's only Norwegian. It means uh, you can do different stuff and you can end up as a good musher. It's a lot of roads to take. <laughs> But uh, uh, my, my road is to have the speed down and then the, And I don't do a lot of testing. The testing will come in the race. But if I know the trail in front and I'm at the, this race site, I can test with different dogs just to see which one is doing better. Because it's really hard to see just 20 seconds. You can't see that just by your eyes. Then you need a watch and yeah. you really need to see it. But um, I think that you find out when you do racing. So, <laughs> uh, and uh, you get to know your dogs. So, yeah, we know which dog is good for this and that. And yeah, yeah. And do you think that the diet that our dogs have it's an important factor for the performance on the races? Yeah, I think it's very important. <laughs> And then again, I think it's like the humans. Yeah. Like if you want to perform as a human, you need to eat right. And you need to get a lot of water. And then, uh, and of course, uh, it's important to eat more than one time each day. So we, we feed them two times and we give water one time. So three times a day, they get something to to eat. And of course, they have water all the time if they want to drink more. But yeah, it's important to have a good um, good food. And you can see that if you see how much they poop, the thing is okay. getting out again. It shouldn't be too much. And you shouldn't have to feed too much to get the hold of the hold you want. You want to have a good hold on your dog, but you don't okay. want it fat. And Yeah, but it's so many good foods. So, and I, I I use the same food for many 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 years, and it's been always been good. So, yeah. yeah. But it's actually not a big issue, at least not here, because uh, most people are feeding a good food. Yeah. So, yeah. And what kind of food do you give to your dogs? Dry food, wet food. Meal. Yeah, 50% dry food and 50% uh, meat. meat. So it's a, it's a raw food, a raw meat and a raw tripe. Yeah. Tripe is uh, the stomach of the cow. Yeah. And um, they are uh, in the freezer. So I just uh, take it out. Will it be there for a couple of hours? And I have 50% dry food pellets in addition. And then a lot of water on top. Yeah. 
And did you do some changes when you are training for important races? Or uh, the diet is the same all year? I give uh, a little less food and a little bit more water. Oh. So in the summer and the beginning of the training, I like them, if it's possible, to have them a little more fat. Because when you start the training, you want to change the fat into muscles. Yeah. But it's uh, but I do feel the same about the same the whole year because in the season competition season my dogs are sleeping inside the house where we are sleeping and then they relax very good after training but in the summertime like now when it's so hot and we don't train we just have fun and then they live outside in kennels and we have a very big dog yard. And they run out there every day. So actually, they use, uh, they need the same amount of energy in the food in the summer as they do in the winter because yeah. we keep them inside in the winter so they don't get too skinny. So, yeah. yes, we, we do the same food in summer and winter or all year round. And do you think that it's important to add supplements on the dog's diet? No, I don't give any supplements. Um, yeah. and, and I have done that earlier. Yeah. And if you believe it in, if you believe in it, like you and me, then yeah. it's good. Because dogs, they read our mind very good, more than I can read your mind and you can read my mind. But dogs, they are really, they, they know how you feel. And oh, wow. if you think it's good, you will send the good energy. And the good. So if you really believe in it, it's okay. But I think that uh, uh, if it makes you a lot better, the dog, to give this yeah. supplement, I'm not sure if the things in the supplement are really legal. I'm oh, really scared yeah. about doping. It's, it's a really, really big thing over here, the doping thing. I mean, big thing you don't do it. It's like being a child abuser if you do the drugs. So, but a little bit oil, you give a little bit oil because it's good for the skin, the coat and the feet. And you can give some additional vitamins. But uh, if it if it's really, really weird and uh, wow project, then it's uh, not sure. <laughs> so now I don't do uh, Yes. And did you look for a special characteristic in the dogs? Uh, no. Uh, or I a didn't... specific breed? Or any dog can... Yeah, if, if, if you want to have my suggestion for which dog to use, of course, then it's a Greyster, a German Shorter Pointer, or a uh, yeah, Eurohound yeah. will be very, very fit for dryland. But when I keep my, I have my own litters, and when I, when we keep a puppy, we uh, we choose when they are eight weeks old, so they're very small. So if it's nothing wrong with the puppies, we choose by color, and by uh, so we like yeah, black dogs and brown dogs <laughs> because. Uh, you never know and you cannot measure a puppy and say oh it will be very big or very small because yeah. the smallest one turns out biggest and the biggest one turns out smallest so no i think we go for the stomach feeling just oh i love this puppy it will be great and good signals and it's just so good uh but if you want to be among the very best ones yeah. you need a hard pulling dog uh, I don't do candy cross because it's really hard for the knees yeah. and uh, it's tradition in Norway. So we, we didn't grow up with that. But uh, I know because I sell puppies, they want to have the strongest, biggest one. They're totally crazy. I would take the smallest one. But uh, uh, going to win the, the European or World Championship candy crossing, you need a really strong, hard-working dog. You should have a Gracer, a GSP, 
or a big uh, Eurohound uh, type Alaska Husky, but it, it cannot be a furry one, not the not the big one. It yeah. should be the print uh, more Eurohound type. But you can have fun with all, all of them. First. So we will welcome and uh, yeah, you can just read the results and then you see. Yeah, we, we also have, uh, as you probably know, the Fed European Chef Federation called the WSA. Yeah. And um, they have their own world championships and they have their own classes. Yeah. Uh, but what we do and what the IFSS is meant for is an open class, meaning that any dog can participate. Yeah. And uh, the pure Siberians, they are slower. So that's why they want to keep their own championships. Yeah. Because you cannot win anything with a Siberian because the others are faster. But it's a quite big uh, group of people doing that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, all due respect. And, that. and did you consider that there is a specific age so puppies can start pulling uh, the cart in the sled? Uh, mm, it used to be allowed to go with the cart or a sled uh, from 12 months. Yeah. But now IFSS changed that rule to 18 months. And I think it's more uh, right to do uh, an early race in one dog class because then the dog decides how fast it will go. Yeah. And I think if you go in a team, it should be, you should be older. Not older than one and a half year, but I think when it was 12 months, it was too early. Because if you are not a, an experienced musher and you put a one year old dog in a team, they just have to keep the same pace as the others. And it can be really, really hard. And I think you can destroy the dog. Uh, there is a specific age to retire the dogs? No. Or what do you take in account to do it? Um, a little bit depending on what you're doing. Because if you do the really hard sprint races, like it's really, really fast. Yeah. Uh, you need to be a little bit crazy too. And like humans, younger people, younger dogs are more crazy if you want to perform very well. Uh, but if you do like polka or long distance racing, mushing, the, the big races with big teams, when the speed goes down, it's so much easier to use them for a longer period. So, but I was a uh, European champion on uh, with polka with the nine year old. Uh, Oh, a third place with a nine-year-old. So, but I think they will, when they get to seven, they start to yeah, get a little slower, maybe. Yeah. And what recommendations can you give us for a better adjustment to the different withers? Uh, how do you prepare your dogs for snow classes and dryland classes so they feel better in both withers? Um, you have to train for the things you are doing. Yeah. So prepare yourself for, for all the situation that can be. So in uh, dryland, it would be training on grass, in rain, in sun, on sand, in hills, turns, uh, fast, speed, whatever, uh, and the same in the winter, in different conditions. Okay. And the dogs can handle anything, and it's just fun for them to do different things. But uh, except for that, it's nothing special for... Uh, so uh, before 2003, before the European, the World Championship in Dryland, we didn't do the training anything dif any different. It's the same thing we do now. So actually, it's nothing special. It's just to be uh, yeah, it's a good job. I know that you have traveled uh, all over the world for competitions. How do you take your dogs to other countries? 
Uh, we, we really like to compete in Germany yeah. because we have a lot of spectators, like a lot of spectators. And that's fun. Where people want to come there and see the dogs and talk to us. That, that's fun. Uh, and uh, I like uh, Alaska <laughs> because it's far away and it's something special, special feeling up there. And you, the moment you leave, you want to get back. So that's a little bit weird because it's so uh, deserted, so far away, but still so nice. And we have some really good, uh, good races in the Alps, uh, yeah. France, uh, Andorra. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And in that uh, part, we have a 14 days race called Pirena, and a uh, stage race. And that was really, really fun. It's so many good things actually all over. In, uh, yeah, so yeah, you can go yeah. anywhere. I even was in Australia, but then we didn't bring oh. dogs. We went uh, to be, yeah, be a part of the race, but uh, talking about training and stuff. Well, um, according to the specifications given by the machine rules, but from your point of view, uh, what are the characteristics that we should taking account when buying the machine equipment? Uh, my tagline would be about 160, I think, if I take my arms out there. Yeah. Just as long as my arms. So it's quite short. You like it short. It gives you more control. Uh, and if you are, um, are many dogs, like in a mass start, uh, or, or also tra and training when you train uh, and meet other people, you have more control of the dog. Um, and we like, uh, we use x -Pack. Uh It gives a very free movement of the shoulder. You see when the dog is running, you can see the whole part here is free. Nothing okay. over, but you also have uh, like we non-stop and they also have a special harness for uh, like bicycling and running called free motion. But it's many great, uh, a lot of great equip equipment out there. So uh, uh, I think the main thing is that you buy something that is used by mushers yeah. because they want to have the best stuff. <laughs> that, that's how uh, Nonstop was uh, was born because it was mushers and they thought, oh, we, we didn't see any development for many, many years and we, we don't yeah. like what we see. And they started to own a quick one. Oh. Uh, and do you recommend some safety equipment for us? Uh, always. And uh, not when you're running, of course. <laughs> uh, biking. So we always use a helmet and I use gloves. Uh, and um, for training, I actually always use pants and a... Uh, not shorts, but pants. Okay. If you are more, uh, it's better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for races, of course, it's less. But always helmet and and of course you need glasses okay. and helmet and gloves. Yeah. So it's nothing special actually. We don't use uh, things here, and you can use it. Of course, yeah. if you are scared, it's better to use it than not to use it because then you get you feel more safe, and it will probably stay on the bike the whole way instead of being scared and about the bike antenna yeah yeah of course of course yeah it's a new life yeah the bike antenna is just great uh, and of course you need a safe bike you need good brakes and all that stuff but i think everyone has that and talking about safety have you suffered any injuries during the competitions no, not really. I when I was thirteen, I was bicycling. That was uh, not competition, but training. And and I decided to go the other direction. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I don't think I actually told them uh, before we went. So it was downhill, like one k from home, with three dogs in front of the bike and me being thirteen. And I was turning left. And they turned right because we did that every, that was stupid for me, of course. 
And then uh, it was an ambulance picking up, but <laughs> it wasn't that serious. No, so nothing like just cutting a little bit fingers and stuff. <laughs> nothing. So it, it hasn't been no no big thing actually because you don't jump on the eight dog team before you you have to go all the steps. Yeah. From stopping one dog and and feel secure about it. You need to be really, really secure before you go to the next level. Oh, okay. And do you have a special technique to fall down on the best possible no, way? Because we don't fall down. <laughs> we have to make falling down. Yeah. No, we no, we shouldn't fall down. You just. You kind of, uh, when you start, especially to dog uh, scooter, yeah. because it can be dangerous. But when you when you have your bib number on, yeah. and it's two, three, one, go, it's like something happens and you don't feel or see the, the difficult things. And then yeah. when you're in that mood, it's normally okay. Uh -huh. But of course, when you just look at it, it's a little bit crazy. I can eat that, but I never had any accident with that. Yeah, it's just to don't let the dog go alone. Never, never. <laughs> okay. And what are your tips or recommendations that we should then miss? when we are training maybe for a championship? Um, you have normal training through the whole year and then when it gets close to the championship, you should rest more. So yeah. you, uh, you, you have a lot of uh, energy and you want to go out running, both for you and the dog. And the training in front of the championship should be shorter just so you keep the high energy. And when you, and when you finish training, you really want to do more. Yeah. Of course, it's important also for the dog to sleep, right? Okay. Sleep, no stress. And also the, the way you travel to art for a dog can be quite uh, exhausting. They can be really have a whole, the heart is beating high and they get stressed too. So try to find a way to travel. So the dogs are calm okay. and of course the thing with the water so you can't just walk it just before the race you have to do that for many months so the body will adjust and understand that they use the water right oh okay so, um, but be happy and sleep well <laughs> and uh, uh, fill up the energy and what should we focus on if we want to go on a world championship? Uh, maybe you should, uh, you shouldn't set your goal too high because okay. the level is really, really high. Yeah. So you can go out there and have fun and maybe you should instead of C classes. Yeah. Because it is hard to have focus on, on everything. And when you travel from a different time zone, it's important to to get the right rest for the dog and you. So, and if it's a really long travel, like the last time we went to Alaska, we we stopped uh, because the travel in the plane is so long for the dogs. We stopped and we stayed in the hotel for one night before we moved further. So uh, it's a lot of stuff like that you can do. Um, mm, yeah, as I said, the, the level is so high. Yeah. So you can't expect, uh, you have to set a goal you can reach. Like uh, maybe you have some uh, training, if you train for 5K or the same di distance as the World Championship, you can try to do that faster and faster home and just make your own goal, kind of. Because they are so serious, the people uh, doing this around the world, and it's really hard to uh, it's, it's hard to be top 10 because it, yep. it's so uh, many people within just a few seconds. So, uh, I think uh, coming over to learn and see and talk to as many people as possible and just to 
get all the information you can and take it back with you would be a good idea. Yeah. And if, I, I think most people is honest and will answer your questions. And we really like to, to get the whole world into this, of course. Okay. So at least in here, it's you usually no secrets. We will answer anything because we want you. Want Thank you. you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that uh, people like you with a lot of experience in machine can talk with us and say what you do to me, how you are. <laughs> and I'm very su surprised about what you have done. You did a movie in 2007. And Last year, you have an interview with a book. I think it's a sport booking. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has been fun. And we were also in, yeah, maybe that was what you said, the, the TV show with the champions. Oh, really? Or champions in Norway. That was yeah. 2018. Uh, so when you retire, uh, some of the sports, Yeah, the retired champions, they, they're asked to be in a TV program on national TV. So yeah. that was really cool because we have other sports that are more popular than machine in Norway. Yeah. So it's very good for the sport to be, to get, yeah, recognition like that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I read in that you was part of the few athletes in Norway that was on the Hall of Fame. Yes. And that, that you have a dinner with the <laughs> king. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. And what can you tell us about this? <laughs> I was, uh, I'm just honored. So, <laughs> and it's from way back. This, this Hall of Fame is all the sports, uh, the famous people in Norway. But it's not many women, because it's always been, like yeah. in many years ago, it was men. So that was, that was really cool. And eating dinner there with uh, all this, uh, the people that were high up in the sport. It's, uh, I, It's important for me, but I think it's mo most important for the sport. I think it's so cool that they, they do they do see us as mushers. Yeah. And we, uh, as we can say. So that's really cool. So that uh, would be what we, we want to show that we are also serious people. Yeah. yeah. And how did you handle so many success in your life? Yeah. Oh, that's hard. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, but there's so many good people, and you are only the world championship for a few seconds, and then you start <laughs> for the next thing. So, yeah. uh, uh, they say a world champion is not something you are; it's something you come or yeah. Yeah. So, well, of course, I'm actually a little bit proud, able to take the first championship in 1991 and the last yeah. one in 2017 wow. that's cool and it's only been seconds all the time the last time i won the world championship i won with less than one second wow. so, uh, uh, i have been lucky but then again i've been lucky so many times so yeah just a small detail uh i don't know question i just uh Uh, I would never be uh, be like that. It's uh, I think it's fun to help others. I want uh, more people in the sport, and and uh, the, the way I am in the sport now is just helping out, having races, having camps, training with others. Uh, I, it, that gives me a lot, and being with kids or young people is very very much fun. Wow. <laughs> And what do you consider that has been the biggest difficulty you have overcome to to achieve your goals? Uh, I, 
everyone expected me to win all yeah. the time and that was hard oh. and of course it's good because if they didn't expect me to win was then i wouldn't be that good but uh it's, that was a little bit uh i was tired of hearing that all the time so if i was number two it was oh what happened and when i won it was just that's normal people didn't care and uh, yeah i think that that has been a little bit hard because i think it's difficult all the time it, yeah. it's always uh yeah uh, i'm always really happy i was always happy always great to to make it but for others it seemed so easy but it was never easy yeah. so yeah i right now uh, or we, we play golf in the summer all the family and i have a pretty good handicap yeah. but still it's like i'm so happy every time i actually hit the ball and it flies the right way even if i'm supposed to be good but still it's yeah it makes you happy maybe, maybe that's why you can continue i don't know so. okay and we can live without telling us an anecdote that has left you a great teaching what's that thing that you remember the most important thing that you have learned uh, that is so hard <laughs> uh, i'm uh, i'm most happy about my kids but I don't think that's the uh, answer for the real question. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to tell. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, but for racing, uh, I don't know. It's been so many nice uh, races. Yeah. And, and victories. Uh, but now my son is racing and I'm not ready. Yeah, I race one, one race. But just being out there, especially in the winter with the sun. Yeah. And seeing the dogs running around free or pulling, or I think you have out there, is yeah. that's why you do this, and and you and, and why you are put on this earth. So maybe that would be the answer because the competition itself wouldn't work out if I didn't like the things behind. Yeah. So, but I, yeah, I think everything. I like everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that you are a great woman. You are an example of perseverance and achievements. Uh, and what would you say to the people who wants to become a musher? And what would you say to people who wants to be better in this sport? Uh, first, they can ask me anything. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to be better, uh, you, you need to like the whole package. You need to love your dogs, respect your dogs, and you need to be willing to train. Maybe you have to offer some parties and stuff with your friends because yeah. you have to do a training instead. So when I was young, I was really, really, I was only out in the bush and uh, not social at all. and everything comes with a price and also this so if you want to be really good i would i would breed or have a puppy from a very good place and I would listen to people that perform well yeah. and i would not take any shortcuts okay so thank you very much for your space and for your time that it worth gold and I hope that this is not the last time that our friends from Machine Sport Line can see you here. I hope uh, I will see you again too because this is also one of the things I love now <laughs> about sport. I think it's quite fun, so don't hesitate if you want to chat again. <laughs> Thank and you good very much. All of you. See Bye. you later. Brother's got a quick hand He's looking around the wrong way
Walk around you with my eyes, sky. Oh.